This is Laura Fisher with Math with Mrs. Fish. This is a demo lesson for parents to see the curriculum, to see my teaching style, to uh, get a sense of what the curriculum looks like. I'm really excited about this, so without any further ado, I want to go ahead and get started. I want to point out this is lesson six in the curriculum. We're going to do six, seven, eight, and nine. You'd be amazed at uh, the information because of the way the curriculum is incremental and distributed. It is very easy to get four lessons in and have the students work from their notes during the rest of the week. Every time there's a, a lesson, there's going to be a materials list, and I do need to edit the one that I put into the OneNote program. We are going to need two different colored pencils, and I am going to suggest that one is blue and one is yellow. You'll see why in just a little bit. We are also coming in, this is kind of midstream because we've been in the prior lessons working with divisibility rules. So y'all are going to have to catch up a little bit. The divisibility rule for six is super easy. If a number can be divided by two and three, then it can be divided by six. This is a screenshot of a foldable that the kids have been working on filling out as they're learning the divisibility rules. We're going to look at 90 here. 90 can be divided by 1, 2, 3, 5, 18, 30, 45, and 90. You can see that we're going through and we're filling in some blanks. 90. Does 2 work? Yes, it does. Does 3 work? Yes, it does. That means 6 works. Now we have to figure out 6 times what will give us 90. And I am going to use a different color for parents to see short division, which the students have been practicing in the earlier lessons. Six goes into nine, excuse me, into nine one time. And when you do the subtraction, there's three left over. Notice I brought the subtraction part up instead of bringing the zero down. Six goes into 30 five times. So it is 6 times 15, that equals 90. Then we go through and we ask ourselves, does 2 work on 91? Nope. So we move on. All of these other numbers have been fully factored, so now we come down to 96. We can see that 2 worked and 3 worked, so that tells us that 6 will work. And parents, I'm moving kind of quickly here because you're not learning the math, you're just seeing how the curriculum and the teaching works. I will go slower for the students, but not super slow that they're getting bored. Again, with short division, six goes into nine one time with three left over, six goes into 36, six times. So it's six times 16 equals 96. So there's one little piece of divisibility rules separated from the others, little bite-sized pieces that students can easily take in. The next concept that we're going to cover in this lesson is the area of a right triangle. We already talked in a previous lesson about finding the area of a rectangle. Mrs. Fish likes to refer to area as square area because we're figuring out how many little squares fill in a shape. So we call it squaria. You can see that we have some vocabulary here. Right angle, legs, base, and height. I do ask for some participation from the students. Sometimes a right angle is called a square angle, and it measures how many degrees? And we'll see if somebody knows that it measures 90 degrees. We're not really talking about degrees in this lesson, but they should have learned that in fifth grade. The right angle is usually marked with a small square. So you can see that little square right there and in the other triangles when they are right triangles. The next vocabulary word is legs. 
the two sides of a right triangle that make up the right angle. So we'll go over to this triangle and we'll label that that is a leg and that is a leg. This other side is a big fancy word called a hypotenuse. That's not something that we're going to cover, but I'll go ahead and mention that. Then we have base and height. And base and height are actually interchangeable in a right triangle. It doesn't really matter which one's which, but what really does matter is that the base and the height of a triangle are always, and this is for all triangles, it is all, they are always perpendicular. Per, pen, dick, you, lar. And I have the lovely feature of being able to adjust my, my uh, placing of my word. The base and the height of a triangle are always perpendicular. They always make that right angle. Very, very important. So the base is usually the side that the triangle is sitting on at the bottom. And then the height is usually the vertical side. This triangle, the longer leg is on the bottom. With the exact same size triangle, it's turned. This time it's the shorter leg that's on the bottom. And this is what I mean when I say that they are interchangeable. It doesn't really matter which one you call base and height. As you'll see, in fact, we'll just cover it right now. Three times four, same thing as four times three. The order doesn't really matter. I will, in the curriculum, make sure that the students are confronted with a triangle where the base and the height are neither vertical nor horizontal. So we need to make sure that they can recognize, oh, I'm looking for that little square. So this side over here could be the base or the height. This side over here could be the height or the base. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that they are perpendicular. That is the part that matters. Before we look at the formulas for the area of a triangle, we just want to come over here and look at this. The area of a right triangle is always half the area of its corresponding rectangle. And corresponding might be a new word for students, but basically we're just saying if you took the triangle and its twin and put them together to make a rectangle, the triangle would be half of that rectangle. And that helps students as we get ready to look at the formula on the next page. And there are really two formulas, base times height divided by two, or one half of the base times the height. We're gonna talk about both and we're gonna see why they are actually the same thing. We're gonna do it with both of those formulas. So the first one in this example, what is the area of the triangle shown? You can see that there are three numbers shown here. I want to make sure that my students are thinking and not just reacting. They're going to have to choose which of those two numbers they're going to use, or which of the three numbers they're going to use. So we're going to write base times height divided by two. And we're going to plug in. We can see the base is 12, the height is two, and we're going to divide by 2. Showing our work, we see 24 divided by 2, which is 12. Because it's square we're going to put square yards. And that's the answer. The area of the triangle is 12 square yards. Now we're going to look at it with the other formula, and we're going to see how they are actually the same thing. One half of the base times the height. 
So we're going to write half of 12 times 2. Of is an incredibly important word. It tends to throw people off. I could still remember when I was in middle school and I finally put the pieces together. Wait a minute. Of means multiply. So much understanding came out of that one little moment. All right, so half of 24. Let's look at it as a multiplication problem. Half of 24 over 1, because if we're going to multiply with fractions, we have to turn the whole number 24 into a fraction by putting a 1 underneath. Look what happens when we multiply across the top and we multiply across the bottom. Dun, 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 dun. Do you see it? They're the same thing. This is why the formula is the same. Some students will automatically know, wait a minute, half of 24 is 12. And that is totally fine. There's some times where I expect my students to show their work, um, but I'm a huge proponent of mental math. And I will be showing your students lots of ways they can do mental math with ease. The students are going to have an opportunity to do another example. In this example, we see that there is no drawing, but the word right is in the problem. What is the area of a right triangle with legs, there's that vocabulary word, that measure 17 meters and 25 meters? Some students might find it helpful to draw a little sketch. And I give students the opportunity to choose which formula they want to use. I'm going to demonstrate it with base times height divided by 2. So we've got 17 times 25 divided by 2. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and just write the, the multiplication answer the product. We've been working with divisibility rules and the students should know that because this is not an even number that it's not going to come out evenly and that's okay. We're going to use short division again to do the dividing and as a fifth grade standard this should be in your child's uh, toolbox, but it does get covered um, in the review at the beginning of the curriculum that we're going to need to put a zero, a decimal and a zero. And we'll go ahead and do the division. Short division. Two goes into four two times with zero left over. Two goes into two one time with zero left over. Two goes into five twice with one left over, and two goes into 10 five times. And the answer is 212.5 square, because it's squarea, and in this case, it's square meters. And so there is the first part of the lesson. It's been about 15 minutes. Now we're going to move on to evaluating expressions, a different topic. Okay, we are going to cover a little bit of vocabulary here. An equation, which we're going to do, we've done in a previous lesson, and we're going to cover again in, I believe it's the next lesson, an equation has an equal sign and can be solved. An expression cannot be solved. You must be given a value for the variables. And then you evaluate 
the expression. We're going to give a value to this thing here. Let's take a look at example three. If x equals 13 and y equals six, what is the value of the following expression? I want to point out here we got x minus six plus five y. 5y is not going to turn into 56. We're going to take this 6 and put it where the y is. But that doesn't mean this is going to become a 56 when you substitute a 6 for the y. I always use red for wrong. Okay? It's not going to be 56. You write it as 5 times 6, which means... 5 times 6. The parentheses is a way of showing multiplication. And it's not necessary for the students to write it with the parentheses. In fact, uh, it'll be easier if we write it with the little x. And I will show you what I mean by that. This is really, um, we've been, uh, we've already covered order of operations in a previous lesson. Now what we're doing is we're going to plug in. So x equals 13 minus 6 plus 5y and the y is another 6 so it's 5 times 6 and the reason why I'm asking students to use a blue and a yellow uh, colored pencil first of all if we use highlighters highlighters have a tendency to smear so colored pencils work better for this. And blue, the letter B, now that's not a good way of writing it. Let's try that again. Blue comes before yellow in the alphabet. B becomes comes before Y. And so the reason why we're doing this is that I want the students to recognize that they have to do the blue part first. So let's let's take a look at what that looks like. This again is from a previous lesson, but we go through and we find any multiplying or dividing. And we start swirling around that multiplication sign. And as we swirl around, we capture the numbers. The numbers get sucked into the little whirlpool of, of blue. And then we do the same thing with the yellow, but we do it on any adding or subtracting part. So I start swirling around the subtraction. And I cover, I get those two numbers. And then this little plus is kind of by itself. And you'll see all the pieces come together here. The yellow part is going to stay. 3 minus 6 plus, I'm going to do the blue first. B comes before Y in the alphabet. We do the blue part first. 5 times 6 is 30. We can take out the yellow again, but students at this point will probably see, oh, okay, we only have the, the adding and subtracting, so we're free to just start working from left to right. 13 minus 6 is 7 plus 30 equals 37. We just evaluated. We put a value in for the x, we put in a 13. We put the value 6 in for the y, and then we consider the value of the whole expression. And this is an expression. You'll notice I didn't even use any equal signs on this. We just kind of worked our way down. And we're going to look at another example. What is the value of the following expression if p equals 8 and q equals 3? I do encourage my students to rewrite the expression with the variables first 24 plus 48 divided by p minus q and then rewrite it with the values plugged in 24 plus 48 divided by what was p it was 8 minus q what was q Three. And I'm going to grab my blue highlighter, start swirling around that division sign, and swirl around so that they, the numbers get sucked into that little blue whirlpool. 
and then go back and do the adding and subtracting with the yellow. This is not a requirement. This is what I call a training wheel. Training wheels have a purpose, but ultimately the goal is to take the training wheels off of the bike. And so students, if they don't feel like they need the blue and the yellow, they are more than welcome to ignore it. But I will show it on the answer sheet for parents and students so that you can readily see if a student makes a mistake. Maybe it was because of the order. I am not doing yellow first, I'm doing blue first because B comes before Y in the alphabet. 48 divided by 8 is 6. Oops, there we go. Minus 3. And again, I can see I have just adding and subtracting. So now it's a matter of simplifying that. And we get 27. While I'm down here, <laughs> parents, you can probably see that the standards are written at the bottom. So the standards for this lesson come from the number system, comes from geometry, it comes from expressions and equations. Uh, I'd like to have that information in there just so parents know that we are covering the standards that we're supposed to cover. And that is the end of lesson six. At this point, I would pause very briefly for the students to kind of shift gears, get up and wiggle, and then we would move on to the next lesson, which is going to be lesson seven. Oh, get that picture. That's for coming up in just a little bit here. And now we're on lesson seven. We can see that the students are still working with their factor list and with uh, their, their, this time actually we're putting in the divisibility rules foldable. I do, uh, on the website, you can see a picture in the photos and videos part of the foldables. This is a resource that the students use to get them excited about taking notes, to get them copying their notes. A lot of, of learning, a lot of retention happens when students copy notes, but enough on that. It's kind of funny here. Uh, the divisibility rules for eight and nine you can see the rule for eight actually isn't terribly useful. Honestly, just use short division and see if eight works. But if you're super interested, you can see the rule on the divisibility rules foldable, which will be a part of your assignment. And yeah, I know students like <laughs> when they think about their work. No, actually, I think most of the times my students get excited about their work because they feel they feel empowered. They feel like they can do it. The rule for nine is just like the rule for three. It is a sum of the digits trick. If the sum of the digits can be divided by nine, then the number can be divided by nine. Quick example, can 9,876 be divided by nine? Let's take a look. Nine plus eight plus seven. Oops, I just wrote a multiplication sign, didn't I? Plus seven plus six. Well, let's see, 17, 24, 30. Can 30 be divided by nine? No. So 9,876 cannot be divided by nine. Can 12,348 be divided by nine? Let's take a look. One plus two plus three plus four plus eight equals, ah, Let's see, I see seven and three, I just made 10 plus eight is 18. Can 18 be divided by nine? Yes, it can. So the answer to this one is yes. And students would go through their foldable and finish filling out the foldable. At that point, they'll be done filling out the foldable with all of the factors, one through 100. It's a great resource that they will use in the following lessons. And now we are going to switch to one-step equations with multiplication. Parents, at this point, the students have already done equations with addition, and I am making them show their work. This is one of those times where 
you know what, Mrs. Fish said so, and you're going to do it. And the reason for that is because it's algebra and the problems are going to get longer and more complicated and students have got to have the habits of showing the steps because there's there could be up to like five, six, seven, eight different places to make a mistake in an equation. And so students have got to have a really uh, good habit of showing all of the steps along the way. So we're going to review Mrs. Fish's two rules for solving equations. The first rule is you do the opposite. And this will make sense to students from the previous lesson, but we'll also talk about it. And whatever you do to one side of the equal sign. Little, little side note here. I would always have students who would want to say the phrase, whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. And that middle part, whatever you do to one side of the equal sign, you do to the other. That is such an important piece that students miss out on. So let's talk about this. This is a room, and this is a room, and this is the hallway. And that variable, that x, is a selfish brat. We talked about this in the previous lesson on equations. The selfish brat says, get out of my room. We're trying to get the selfish brat, that variable, all by itself in one room and a number in the other. And the way we do that is by doing the opposite. And the opposite of multiplying is dividing. Those are both opposites. And we're going to take a look at how that works. Here we go. This is 6 times x. They're right next to each other. It means multiplication, and the opposite of multiplying is dividing. So we're going to divide by 6 and divide by 6. And we are showing these two steps. We're showing the next step, which is crossing out those sixes. And we'll talk more about that in a previous or in a, a uh, upcoming lesson why they get to be crossed out. This here is 168 divided by 6. And this is an opportunity for me to introduce to students a memory device called Cowboy and Horse. You'll notice that I have a picture of President Reagan. P POTUS, 40th POTUS, that means President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who was an accomplished horseman. And I just like to throw in a little bit of uh, extra learning whenever I can. So let's take a look at cowboy and horse. 168 divided by 6. We're going to put a cowboy hat. You can see why Mrs. Fisher teaches math and not art. Okay. The cowboy always rides on top of the horse. And here's the horse's tail. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. You're wondering where I'm going with this. The cowboy gets to go inside the house. But the horse has to stay outside because he poops on the floor. And yes, every now and then I'll throw in a little bit of potty humor. I don't know, maybe it's because I work with middle school students, I still laugh at potty humor. All right. We're going to do short division. And I want to point out also, my goal is to get kids to where they don't even have to write it out like this. They can just do it in their heads. 6 goes into 16 twice. That's 12, so when we subtract, we're going to get 4. 6 goes into 48, 8 times. x equals 28. Boom. Done. This part of the showing work, 
must have it. And the answer sheet has the place to write it. In fact, I'll go ahead and show you the answer sheet. I think this is the answer sheet. No, that's the assignment. Oh, and that's lesson seven. Well, anyway. Ah, now I've lost track of where I am. Do, do, do. Oh, lesson answer sheet. There we go. Let me show parents this. Here you can see an addition one where you have to show your work. Um, oh, which one? Is, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Oh, we're on lesson seven. That's my problem. Ah. Okay. There it is. You can see the the students are going to have the place to show the work right there on their answer sheet. All right. So let's go back to the lesson. Over here, we have the variable is on the right side and in the work it's on uh, I mix it all up because they can expect to see that in any standardized testing any curriculum that they're going to see in the future so let's take a look the selfish brat the Y wants to be by herself so she says get out of my room so we're going to do the opposite we're going to divide by 10 and divide by 10 cross out. This is the part they must show the work. I purposely made this one divided by 10 in the hopes that the students will pick up the little trick that comes when you divide by 10, 100,000, those numbers that end in zeros. 10 goes into 93 nine times with three left over. 10 goes into 35 three times with five left over. 10 goes into 50 five times. Hopefully the students are going to see, oh, it's the exact same digits. It's just that there's a decimal in a different spot. Y equals 93.5. And that problem is done. One more concept in this lesson. You'd be surprised at how engaged the students are, even though we do a lot of stuff all in one class session. I have had students more times than I can count walking out of my classroom going, I can't believe that was an hour. That went so fast. And it's because the students are engaged. They're not exhausted by trying to keep up with the note taking. They're excited because they're feeling empowered by being able to do the math because the math has been uh, taught to them incrementally. Following John Saxon's model from Saxon Math. I just love Saxon Math. So let's take a look. The next thing we're going to do is looking at some statistics and probability uh, strand. This is finding the median. Oops. The average or mean, and that again is from a previous lesson, is a measure of center. Boys and girls, this is going to be important. This is going to be on your homework. Um, it's going to come up in, in uh, lessons to come. It's going to show up on standardized tests. You want to understand measure of center. We'll talk more about it in the future. Right now, we're just going to get a sense of what a measure of center is. Another measure of center, it's so important, we're writing it twice. is something called the median. A median on a street is in the middle of the street. And I have a picture. That grassy area there in the middle is the median in the street. In some cities, the medians are landscaped nicely. In other places, it could just be uh, some lines painted in the, you know, the middle of the road, but it's a median. The median in math is the center of a set of numbers. So here's an example. 
what is the median of the following set of numbers? So we have an 8, 10, 14, 12, and 16. There's two different ways of doing this. The first method is the cross out method, but the most important thing is you've got to put the numbers in order. They have to be in order from smallest to largest. If a student's going to make a mistake, this is probably where they'll make it. So the smallest number in this list is 8, followed by 10, then 12, 14, and 16. Another area of making mistakes, they leave out a number. So I usually like to check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yep, I got them all. What you can do to find the number that's in the middle, and it's kind of easy when it's a, not a whole lot of numbers, but cross out the first and last numbers repeatedly until only one is left. So I cross out the first and the last. The first remaining one and the last remaining one until I get to the middle. 12 is the median in that list of numbers, that set of numbers. The counting method, it's still the same in that you have to put the numbers in order. This is a different problem, so but we still have to put the numbers in order. So let's see, it looks like 10, 11, and it helps if we cross stuff out, 13, 14, oh, we got two 17s, and a 19. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, I got them all. So there's seven numbers. So in fact, look here, count the numbers, divide by 2, and round up. Half of 6 is 3, so half of 7 is 3 and a half. We round that up and we get 4. We're going to count the list to that number. 1, 2, 3, 4. Boom. That's the median. That's the middle. That is the end of Lesson 7. We're going to look at lesson eight. Students would get a little wiggle break, chance to maybe run to the bathroom, get a drink. I will have a timer running uh, so that people will know, kind of get out of a sense of where we are as far as getting back to work. I'm trying to get my, there, oh, almost at it. There we go. Get that out of the way. Lesson eight. Oh, this is one of my favorite things to teach with a coordinate graph. So we're going to need a pencil, always, because math is always done in pencil. Pink, yellow, red, sand colored, and blue colored pencils. Those are the items that we need for this lesson. We're going to go ahead and jump in. And we are going to do some vocabulary. I'm going to do talk about, in fact, I'm going to use my black pen here. X axis is the horizontal number line. And we're going to come down here and we're going to put x axis. You'll notice I write my x for x axis in cursive. It's kind of the standard. The y axis is the vertical number line. It's the one that goes up and down. So you've got two number lines that are intersecting. Here's where my color coding comes in. In fact, let me go here, highlighter. Okay. Pink, pink, and while we have the pink, we're going to do this. We're going to put pink here. And again, I like colored pencils. Um, if we try to use highlighters here, then the paper becomes wet with the ink, and when you go to write on top of it with your pencil, it tears, so 
it's kind of inconvenient to use the highlighters. Since I've got my pink out, shoot, I'm just going to go and do this on all of my graphs here. And now I'm going to get my yellow highlighter. And we're going to use that for the vertical number line. And it's going to be here and here and here. You're probably fast forwarding parents, right? I don't need to spend time watching this part. Well, sorry. Okay. Sorry, not sorry. Just kidding. All right. A little more vocabulary and then we're going to get to the good stuff. Origin. Origin is the spot where the two number lines intersect. That's the origin right there. And finally, ordered pair. Two numbers written in a specific order inside parentheses. Parent, key, sis, parentheses. That identify a precise location of a point. All right, memory trick. You have to walk into an elevator before you can go up. That's our little walking man right there. You can see that he is walking on the pink number line. We're going to be writing two numbers. And that's going to tell where a certain point is. You have to walk into an elevator before you go up. Okay, we're going to find point A. Everybody find point A on the graph. There it is. If we look at the pink number line first, that horizontal, and we look to see what number it's above. Now, I'm going to draw a little line, dotted line. Um, if you do that too much, your page starts getting messy. So you could follow it down. Some, some kids like to use an index card to help them uh, make sure they're going nice and straight. And I can see that the A is above the two. And then I look at the yellow number line, the Y axis, and I see that it's across from the eight. So point A is located at two, eight. Point B is over here, above the pink horizontal number line. I can see it's above the 8 and across from the 2. Did you see what I did there? I picked two points that have the exact same numbers. But as you can tell, they are located in very different positions. So the order is extremely important. Extremely important to have the correct order. Point C. And by now, hopefully the kids are already jumping in and doing this. And I don't have a problem with kids moving ahead, as long as they're checking back in mentally. Aha, and here's where a student would want to check in. This is one of the ones where a student will make a mistake. It's on the five on the pink number line, and it goes up zero. For some reason, the ones with the zeros throws kids off. Point E, as far as the pink number line goes, it's above the zero and it rises up to the seven. And then the students would have the opportunity to practice it on their own and check their understanding. Parents, I'm gonna go ahead and just put these in to honor your time. Notice that one is called the origin. Oops, there we go. 
and seven, seven, and eight, nine. The parentheses are important. You have to have the parentheses or it's not an ordered pair. And now we're moving on to the lesson nine notes and we're almost done. All right, ratios. Oh my goodness, wait a minute, I just realized, no, I'm not done. Shame on me. I beg your pardon. <laughs> we have a whole nother page here. I'm rushing because I know I'm a parent and I know how precious your time is. Positive and negative numbers. All right, negative numbers. The farther we go to the left, the smaller the numbers get. And the farther we go to the right, the larger the numbers get. Zero is still the origin on a number line. Negative numbers get used a fair amount in everyday life. Negative numbers can be used to express numbers that are below sea level. So here's where your sand colored, colored pencil comes in. We're gonna draw a little swoop there. And we're gonna draw some water. And we're gonna draw our person standing on the seashore. He is at zero feet, we'll call it. And as the numbers go down, they are negative below sea level. Below zero on a thermometer. We're going to go ahead and make this zero degrees and we're going to use a red normally red is wrong but here it's going to represent a temperature below zero usually in a thermometer it's red so below zero and debt that horrible horrible thing if I have only $10 in my checking account and I write a check for $15, I am now in debt $5, which gets written as negative five. Plus I'm gonna be in debt a whole lot more because the bank charges you when you write a check for more money than you have in your account. And that's a whole nother lesson entirely. So we are going to be comparing positive and negative numbers. And we're going to go inside this little fancy thing here. The bigger, and notice that's in quotations, the bigger the number, the smaller it actually is when it's a negative number. I'll give you a second to write that in. The bigger the number, the smaller it is when it's a negative number. Let's take a look here. We've got negative 12 and negative 24. Our number line up above doesn't have those numbers on it, but we can picture the 12, the negative 12 would be over here, and the negative 24 would be way over here. That's like part of the number line. So it's actually smaller. So we're going to put the greater than symbol because negative 12 is actually bigger than negative 24. Zero is always bigger than any negative number. So zero is greater than negative eight. And then on a number line, this is something that's covered in a previous lesson. And now we're expanding on it with the negative numbers. 
we talk about Kit Kat bars. The little tick marks on the line, uh, the number line, are the breaks in the Kit Kat bars. What we're really interested in is the chocolate. So I can look at this and see, okay, this is in thirds. There's three Kit Kat bars in between the negative five and the negative six. And so this dot is at negative five and two thirds. Again, um, reading the number line comes in a previous lesson and we're just adding on now with the negative numbers. And moving on to exponents, a shortcut for expressing 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7, plus 7, plus 7, plus 7, plus 7 <laughs> is 6 times 7. There's 6 7s. But, and that's a big but right there. That's right, a little more potty humor. But, what if the expression is 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. Notice here I'm using a little dot. That's probably new for the students. That means times. We use something called exponents. There's one, two, three, four, five, six sevens. And we write it like this. Seven with a little six bumped up there. Exponents are powerful. And we're going to get out a calculator here. I want you to see this. So here's my calculator. I'm going to do seven times seven. I just used two sevens, right? Seven times seven is 49. Now, if I keep hitting the equal sign, it's going to multiply by seven. So I've done two sevens three sevens, four sevens, five sevens, six sevens. Check that out. Seven to the sixth power is 117,649. Holy smokes. Okay. 117,649 is what 7 to the 6th power equals. In fact, it's so powerful that we say, the way we read this expression is 7 to the 6th power. Example 4, evaluate 3 to the 3rd power. 3 times 3 times 3. I'm emphasizing the times because, <coughs> excuse me, students will want to do 3 times 3 up here and say that the answer is 9 when it's actually 27 because 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. 2 to the 4th power is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. The cool thing about this is you can do it this way. 2 times 2 is 4, and then again 2 times 2 is 4, and then you do the 4 times 4, and you get 16. And so 16 is the answer. We can do it with variables. One, two, three, four, five. There's five m, so we're going to write m to the fifth power. And that is the end of lesson eight. And again, forgive me, parents, for jumping ahead here. Let's go to lesson nine, and this is the last one. Now let me check my, my recording here. Okay. We're still under an hour. There's going to be, again, it's about an hour and a half lesson. So it, it does seem like a lot, but the students are really, really engaged. And because of the notes and because of the incremental teaching, they are small, manageable bites of information. The students are able to go to their assignment 
um, and refer to their notes if they need to. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to look at ratios, opposites, and surface area. You'll notice I put in here three colored pencils of the student's choice, and then a red pen or pencil. And we'll talk about red is wrong in Mrs. Fisher's classroom. I like to point out common mistakes to my students so that they, they don't make the common mistake. Ratios. A ratio is a relationship. Relation ship between two numbers. Ratios look just like fractions and they get simplified like fractions with some exceptions. In fact, fractions are ratios. We're going to talk about that in a later lesson, but fractions are ratios and we're going to talk about the exceptions in just a little bit, that exceptions thing right here. Okay, so ratios are super easy. And some people freak out when they hear about ratios, and they shouldn't. So let's check this out. Example one, Mrs. Fish has 18 pens and 13 markers in her desk. What is the ratio of pens to markers? Hugely important. The order matters. In fact, we're going to write that. The order matters, and it matters a lot. Okay? Pens to markers. Notice how I've written a P for pen and M for markers, working from top to bottom. How many pens? 18. How many markers? 13. The ratio of pens to markers is 18 to 13, and we can also write it 18 to 13. I typically like to write it as a fraction because we do treat the ratios like fractions quite a bit. Look at example two. Mrs. Fish has nine mechanical pencils and 18 wood pencils in her desk. What is the ratio of mechanical pencils to wood pencils? First thing I'm doing, underlining those two things, and then mechanical to wood. I'm writing those two letters down in order to make sure I'm keeping track. Okay, mechanical. 9, wood, 18. As I mentioned up above, we simplify just like we would with fractions. Both of these can be divided by 9. So I'm going to write divided by 9 over 9. Now this really isn't the proper way of showing this, but it works for what we're doing. 9 divided by 9 is 1. 18 divided by 9 is 2. That's the ratio. For every 9 mechanical pencils, there are 18 wood pencils. Example 3. Miss Fish has 2 glue bottles and 18 glue sticks in her desk. What is the ratio of glue sticks to glue bottles, sticks to bottles. Notice what I did here. In the problem at the beginning, it gives the glue bottles first, followed by the glue sticks. But the ratio that's asked for is the glue sticks to the glue bottles. And this is why it's so important to underline the information and write what they're asking for right away. In this case, okay, the sticks is on top, so I'm taking that 18 and I'm writing it on top. The glue bottles is on the bottom. Grab your red pen or pencil. 
This is not, remember, red is wrong. The answer is not nine. You completely lose sense of the ratio when you don't have the two numbers. So we're going to rewrite this 18 to 2. We're going to show the division this way, even though that's not really proper. 18 divided by 2 is 9. 2 divided by 2 is 1. This is how you would write it. Now, put a little asterisk next to that. And then come up here and put the asterisk with the exceptions. Okay. We treat them like fractions except in one of these cases where if there's a 1 in the bottom, we're still going to leave that 1 there. We're not going to take it away like we did here with the red. Example 4. Let's see. We'll go with purple. There are 51 red ants and 68 black ants on the picnic table. What is the ratio of black ants to red ants? Black to red. Black is 68. Red is 51. Students, get out your factors 1 to 100 and look to see what the greatest common factor is. What's the biggest number that 68 and 51 can both be divided by? And here I'd wait a moment, let the kids look it up and see that 17 goes into both of those numbers. So the ratio of black ants to red ants is 4 to 3. For every 4 black ants, there are 3 red ants. Opposites. New, new topic. The opposite of up is down. The opposite, oh, excuse me, I've got an alarm going off. <laughs> the opposite of left is right. The opposite of negative 8 is positive 8. Opposites. It's that easy. Let's take a look. I'm going to grab a yellow here. There's zero. Here's, well, let's see, we started with negative 8. Here's negative 8. Here's positive 8. They are on opposite sides of the zero. And we're going to write that. They are on opposite sides of the zero. What is the opposite of six? Let's get a new color. Well, here's six. The opposite is negative six. What is the opposite of one fourth? Let's get a new color. Pink. The opposite is negative one fourth. There and there. <laughs> kind of estimating. Okay. Grab your red pen. We're going to talk about red is wrong for a second. The opposite of one fourth is not four over one. That is something called a reciprocal. 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 And then we have this weird little thing here. This is part of the standards. This little negative right here can be read as the opposite of. Give you a second to write that down, kids. Okay. 
we've got this weird expression. It's got two negative signs in it. And we can read this as the opposite of negative 18. And the opposite of negative 18 is positive 18. So 18 would be the answer to that. Final concept is surface area. In the previous lesson in the assignment, the student would have uh, cut out a shape like this and had a chance to play with it, practice folding it along the lines to turn it into a box. Um, that was in Lesson 8. So the shape to the right is a smaller version of the one you cut out as a part of Lesson 8's problem set. When folded, it becomes a box called a rectangular prism. That shape that we know as a box is actually called a rectangular prism in math. When we unfold it so that it looks like this, we call it a net. Not like a fishing net. <laughs> and we can use it to find the surface area of the box. So we've learned how to find the area of a rectangle. So now we're going to take that information and use it to find the area of a rectangular prism. Some important stuff to know. There are six faces, but only three sizes. So get that written down, and then we're going to talk about it. Six faces. If you think about dice, if you think about a single die, the, the side is called a face. So that's actually a, a math term. It's called a face. And we are looking at the face of the of the rectangular prism here. We're looking at the six different faces. If you look at this, you can see that there are numbers for the lengths, the measurements, but it looks like that their stuff is missing, but there's not. And this is where you're going to grab your colored pencil. So pick one of your colors and we're going to see how the information is actually all there. It might seem to be missing. So let's do this. We're going to grab, let's grab that really short side. Okay, we've got, it's four feet. Tells us that it's four feet. This one tells us that it's four feet. This one tells us that it's four feet. In playing around with the net, the one that you cut out and you folded, and you'll get a chance to fold this, is that you're going to see, well, these sides are going to come together when you fold it up, and so they're actually the same length. So this one is four feet, this one is four feet, and that's because this rectangle, the two sides are going to have the same length, and this one is four feet. This is actually, well, no, I'm going to get ahead of myself here and I don't want to do that. Grab a different colored pencil. I think I'll use pink this time. And let's do, let's do the nine feet. This side is nine feet. And because this is a rectangle, that means this side has to be 9 feet. And if this side is 9 feet, then this one must be 9 feet. This one over here is 9 feet, which means this one is. And it means this one is 2. And now what we're left with is the seven feet. And we can see that one and that one because they're on opposite sides of the rectangle. This one because it's on the opposite side of this rectangle. Oops. This one. Oh, and I just realized I missed something here, didn't I? 
some of you are probably yelling in the background, you missed it, that one's four feet. Okay, alrighty, so let's take a look at this. The biggest rectangular face, oh, and I missed another one, good heavens. There we go. The biggest rectangular face, the fat one there, is nine feet, and let me go just with black here, is nine feet by seven feet, and there are two of them Okay, there are two of those seven by nine. So we have 63 times two, and I'll go ahead and be your calculator, is 126. The long skinny face, that's this one right here, is nine feet by four feet. by four feet, nine by four, and there are two of those. So we have 36 times two is 72. And then the smallest rectangular face is four feet by seven feet. So I'm gonna write seven and four, and there are two of those. So now I have 28 times two, which is 56. And I add up all the sides, or all the faces, I should say, because that's the correct word, faces. And I see 12, 13, 14, 9, 10, and 5 is 15, and 2. So the surface area is 254 surface square area, square feet. And there we are. That is four lessons in one hour and 12 minutes. <laughs> and if you've got any questions, please feel free to email me using the math with Mrs. Fish .com.